Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi says his country is hurt and angry following Monday's water crash. The disputed region is the first deadly crash on this border in 45 years. China has broken the peace after 45 years. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching The Listening Post, working from home. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. China, India, and the border dispute that turned deadly. What is actually happening on the line of actual control? Advertisers pull the plug on Facebook, temporarily at least. They say it's their way to get hate messages off the platform. It's called Neo-Ottoman Cool. Turkey is exporting its history through epic TV adventures from the days of empire and paying lip sync service For one million people. to the president of the United States. The two most populous countries in the world, China and India, are dealing with the fallout of the first deadly border clash between them in almost half a century. 20 Indian soldiers were reportedly killed, some clubbed to death by Chinese forces in a pitched battle on what's known as the Line of Actual Control, the LAC. What we do not know is just about everything else. The confrontation took place in the middle of nowhere, at 14,000 feet of altitude, on a Himalayan mountain that journalists cannot get to. And the two governments are saying very little. So the Indian news media are doing their thing speculating, talking boycotts, urging their political leaders to wage an economic war against China. On the other side of the disputed border, the coverage is almost non-existent. This is a story about narratives and two governments that in their own ways are out to keep a lid on this conflict before it gets out of hand. Our starting point this week is the Sino-Indian border. Even in the year 2020, with everything that has happened, this story is in a category of its own. A border clash between two nuclear powers with a combined population of more than 2.7 billion, their soldiers engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, at least 20 lives lost. A conflict with enormous implications that we know almost nothing about, since it happened in the most remote place imaginable an almost unpopulated corner of the Himalayas. The terrain is very remote, with the exception of uh, troops from either side. There's very little vegetation or human habitation. The Indian government hasn't allowed press to visit the area, and the details that we are getting are trickling from sources in the Indian army. The army has, uh, has been given some information confirming that the episode did take place, but in terms of a statement from the External Affairs Ministry, that's not taking place so far. The internet in the area has been shut down and there's barely any communication available to the people um, living in the area. And that's been a problem for the journalists as well. So we have to rely on sources on the Indian side, as well as whatever we are hearing from the Chinese side in their state media. But we know way more from the Indian side because, because of the press freedom in India versus China. This conflict goes back more than a century, but it hasn't claimed lives since 1975. The so-called line of actual control separating China from India is the world's longest disputed border. The question of who controls what territory elicits different responses depending on who and when you ask, or whether you're in Beijing or Delhi. Only one national leader has been heard from on this confrontation. India's Narendra Modi. Citizens accustomed to the Prime Minister flexing his nationalist muscles on issues like this got something a little different. What we have is a Prime Minister who calls an all-party meet and ends it with the statement that there has been no skirmish and nobody's crossed the border and there's nobody on our side. No हमारे बीस जाबाज सहीद हुए, लेकिन जिन्होंने भारत माता की तरफ आंख उठाकर देखा था, उन्हें वो सबक सिखा कर गए। We are talking about dead soldiers. There are bodies in bags. He was trying to say, okay, this is over. If I don't admit it, I don't have to explain it. I don't have to be accountable for it. 
But uh, statements by the Indian Prime Minister do not remain confined to the context in which they are made, especially when they are televised. Rashtriya Suraksha ke liye jo bhi jaruri kari hai. The inadvertent effect of that statement was that the Chinese side ended up with the conclusion that the Indian side is admitting indeed that the Chinese PLA had never entered Indian territory and that was used as an evidence to make an argument it's the Indian side that's the aggressor. The Chinese seized his video, put subtitles on it and released it to their audiences and to the world on social media platforms. It was almost as though he was speaking the script written for him by the Chinese government. But if India releases all the gruesome details, uh, it might incite people to demand sterner action from the Indian government, which could potentially escalate into a war. So the Indian side is wary for that reason. The Modi video that circulated on Chinese social media was put there and helpfully subtitled by the Communist Party's youth wing. The more traditional news outlets Beijing controls have been almost invisible on this story. The Indian media are China's polar and ideological opposites. In India, the market rules. There are more than 450 24-hour TV news channels there, almost all of them privately owned and ratings driven. They set the global benchmark for collective bellicosity on the airwaves. Contrast that with the Chinese media, which have yet to report the casualty figures, even official ones. For the Chinese government, the most important thing is to make sure that they control the narrative and they do not allow anybody to say anything which might potentially complicate the situation and embarrass them. The Chinese do not want the border incidents to escalate unwittingly of a reporting on the graphic details of the border incident might well stimulate a very strong nationalistic outburst in China, which would not be in the interest of the Communist Party. On the other hand, Hindu nationalists are a core part of Narendra Modi's constituents. He is not above flirting with radical elements on social media if it keeps them in his camp. But the Prime Minister knows this is not the time to fly the flag or talk tough with China, that India is outgunned in this dispute, militarily and economically. The last time the two sides came to blows, 45 years ago, their economies were relative equals. China's has since grown into the world's second largest. It's now five times the size of India's, and the subcontinent is reliant on all kinds of Chinese products, right down to the phones and televisions Indians use to get their news. A fact that somehow eluded Indian talking heads, who have been urging their viewers to launch a border dispute boycott of Chinese brands. I am a because I will boycott the Chinese pocket. I will fight with our bullets, लेकिन हमारे बटुए से हमको लड़ना पड़ेगा और चीनी अर्थव्यवस्था की कमर तोड़नी पड़ेगी। There has been these TV anchors uh, from Times Now and Republic TV promoting this uh, hashtag to stop buying these Chinese products. But the irony is that some of these TV channels are sponsored by uh, Chinese companies themselves, uh, like Vivo and Hair. So you are promoting this narrative, but then at the same time you're taking money from these Chinese companies. One screenshot of a show like that um, just makes such a mockery of, uh, of the kind of message that they're trying to give out on my social media feed. There was a still image of a child throwing a very cheap toy into uh, a dustbin. It was made in China, apparently. Clearly all this is being filmed by a smartphone. And the still image has got the watermark of the phone, and that's a Chinese-made phone. Instead of focusing on the kind of dignified retaliation that a country like India should be uh, coming back with, is you're allowing your people and your media uh, to actually um, dumb down the discourse in this in this vile manner. Meanwhile, the comparative silence of the Chinese news media is the sound of censors quietly going about their work. You've got to read between the red lines. Round one in this media battle goes to President Xi Jinping and China, and he hasn't said a thing. Narendra Modi should take note, but that's never been his style. The damage to India is monumental, and he should go on television 
and try to undo that damage. There was a cartoon published in an Indian newspaper the day after Modi made his remarks. It showed 20 Indian soldiers watching television in heaven and wondering why they died. And it, it, the Chinese absolutely love that. So the Prime Minister of India is being used as an asset of Beijing's. He didn't aid them, he abetted them. It was surreal. It would be called surreal if it wasn't the only reality available to us. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar now with one of our producers, Flo Phillips. Flo, some major companies announced this past week they're pulling their advertisements off of Facebook. So what's going on here? Boycotting is what's going on, Richard. Big names like Ben & Jerry's, Patagonia, North Face. It's a growing list of advertisers who say that they're going to stay away from Facebook for the entire month of July over the platform's failure to do more to remove hate speech. It's all part of a new campaign called Stop Hate for Profit, a group formed after the killing of George Floyd and the subsequent protests. The organisers, which include the ADL and the NAACP, put out this joint statement. The social media company is amplifying the messages of white supremacists, permitting incitement to violence and is failing to disrupt bad actors using the platform to do harm. Now, there's been a lot of criticism over Facebook, including some from CEO Mark Zuckerberg's own staff, over its failure to take action on inflammatory posts from, among others, President Trump. And what impact is this boycott likely to have on the company's operations? 99% of Facebook's revenue comes from advertising, almost $70 billion last year alone. So the campaign organisers are hoping that by encouraging companies to boycott, it's going to give Facebook the incentive it needs to change. In order to really make a dent on the company's revenues, however, Stop Hate for Profit would need buy-in from thousands of businesses. Facebook says that it's, quote, taking steps to review our policies, ensure diversity and transparency when making decisions on how we apply our policies, and advance racial justice and voter engagement on our platform. But how many times have we heard this kind of talk before? And one industry that's yet to join this boycott is politics. The U.S. elections are just five months away now. What's, what's the likelihood of those election campaigns being able to wean themselves off of Facebook? Not much. Both Biden and Trump are all over the platform. Biden has actually spent $1.6 million on Facebook ads in a single day this month. Now, one of those ads, which ran for a couple of days last week, took issue with what Trump has been saying about racial unrest in America. Biden accused the president of fanning flames of, quote, white supremacy, hatred and violence thereby implicitly referring to platforms like Facebook, where, of course, the Biden campaign is heavily invested. OK, thanks, Flo. It's been on the air for five seasons now. There have been more than 400 episodes. And with hundreds of millions of viewers, Derelish Arturul, or Arturul's Resurrection, is one of Turkey's biggest television exports yet. And this is a country that's among the top exporters of TV content in the world. Derelish Arturul is a historical epic. It's set in the 13th century. It's on the founding of the Ottoman Empire. The show cashes in on a wave of nostalgia and fascination for that era, what's known as Neo-Ottoman Cool. But given the topic, the time period, and the current geopolitical context, there's a propagandistic feel to the show and others like it that plays right into the hands of Turkey's ruling party, the AKP, and President Erdogan's own brand of Turkish nationalism. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on how history, politics, and entertainment collide in Turkey's Ottoman epics. Every community, every nation, has a trove of key stories, alluring magnetic narratives that are retold time and again. In Britain, there are stories of royalty, from the past to the present. Hagane 
In Korean popular culture, the campaign for independence from Japan is a recurrent theme. Osmanlı'nın yeni topraklar keşfetmekteki arzusu ilahi kelimetullah inancımızdan feyz almaktadır. And in Turkey, over the past decade or so, Ottoman history, the opulence, conquests, power, has been one of the most popular storylines across media, but especially on TV. Turkey is a society in constant change, a society in constant flux, and in such countries, in times of crisis especially, history emerged as a cement, which plays a significant role in creation of identities. The rising interest in Ottoman stories, Ottoman past, in terms of TV dramas, has been a really, really important phenomenon. Ottoman themed shows were not popular up to a point. Um, in fact, um, the most popular shows were um, romantic dramas. Ben Süleyman. And then suddenly, around 2011, Magnificent Century or Muhteşem Yüzyıl became a big hit. That has been a catalyst for this change and we're seeing more of the Ottoman-related, Ottoman-inspired shows in Turkish television. Magnificent Century was an unqualified success, an international hit, watched by tens of millions across the Middle East, Asia and Latin America. It put the country's TV industry and the dramas it produces, dizzies as they're called in Turkish, into the big leagues. That was back in 2011. Four years later, Dirilish Ertrul, or Ertrul's Resurrection, came on the air, confirming the international appeal of Dizis and opening up new markets. In Pakistan, for instance, the series gets blockbuster ratings on PTV, the state broadcaster there. The plot of, um, of Earth Rule is centered around the founders of the, of the Ottoman um, Empire. Biz Türküz. İmdi'ye de korkmadık. İmdi'den sonra da korkmayacağız. Korkmayacağız! Telling stories about the founding of the Ottoman Empire. One aspect of the popularity of these series is that they show the Middle East, the Muslim cities at the center of the world, contrasting with portrayals of the West as weak and divided. In Ertuğrul, um, we see the defeat of the Crusaders. These themes of um, kind of Islamic pride definitely uh, contribute to its popularity, and Pakistan is a good example of that. The Rilish Ertuğrul being popular specifically in the Muslim world is fascinating by itself. So there are a couple of elements to look at why. The first one is cultural proximity. There is so much cultural overlap between uh, Middle Eastern neighbors and Turkey. And also after the success of Magnificent Century, fascination with everything that is related to the Ottoman Empire became very popular. And the consumption of that became cool. Neo-Ottoman cool is a term that I and uh, my colleague Marwan Kredi coined to reflect that new image of Turkey that started perhaps around 15 years ago. It demonstrated that shift of perception from Turkey as an enemy to Turkey as a model. And Turkish soft power was perhaps at its height with the rise of President Erdogan at, at the time. And this went hand in hand with the popularity of Turkish popular culture, particularly Turkish um, TV series. For President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his Justice and Development Party, known as the AK Party in Turkey, reconnecting with the Ottoman era has been central to their messaging. Kültürün her alanında birikimimizi sahiplenecek değerlerimizi yaşatacak çalışmaları ön plana çıkarmalı ve desteklemeliyiz. In his more than 15 years in power, Erdogan has pushed a notion of continuity, drawing a line from the Ottoman sultans through to himself. Türkiye Cumhuriyeti tıpkı daha önceki devletlerimizin birbirlerinin devamı olduğu gibi Osmanlı'nın devamıdır. Erdogan has done that while locking up his critics in the news media, transforming Turkey into one of the world's leading jailers of journalists. Scores of academics and dissidents have been imprisoned as well. Amidst all of that, the TV dramas, Dirilish Arturul, 
and a spin-off, Paithat Abdul Hamid, both of which were commissioned by Turkey's state broadcaster, TRT, have aligned nicely with the AKP's communication strategy. Uh, Ottomanism and Neo-Ottomanism has begun to be an influential domestic and international uh, political instrument. And this has been further consolidated during the AKP era. Allah için, devlet için, töre için yaşayacağız. The whole plot of Dirilish Ertuğrul is uh, a reenactment of contemporary Turkish politics. The people on the one hand, the enemies of the people on the other hand. The leader on the one hand, the enemies of the leader on the other hand. Elements of the show Dirilish Ertuğrul specifically and also recently Payitat Abdulhamid have been used for pro-AKP and pro-Erdogan um, initiatives, especially the political rallies and campaigns. <laughs> For example, in the presidential campaign in 2017, this video specifically demonstrates that there's a historical continuity between the Ottoman Empire and President Erdogan. For audiences cynical both of Erdogan and of Turkey's role in the region, the comparisons between Ottoman TV heroes and the Turkish president not only fall flat, they're seen as a not-so-subtle flexing of muscles, a signal that Turkey can, through its cultural exports, try to soften public sentiment that has undeniably hardened across a number of Arab nations, not least because of Turkey's role in two wars, in Syria and Libya. These drama series um, take added importance because they are often in interpreted by governments as part of that um, Turkish political and military push. And we can see kind of a counter uh, historic interpretation in a number of uh, new big budget series that are produced by Arab countries like the UAE and Egypt and Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Mamalik al Nar is one of the more recent examples. It takes up the Mamluk period as its backdrop and kind of shows uh, in, a, in a very negative light the Turkish historic in intervention um, in Egypt and, and some portrayals mock Turkish um, historical figures. Ideological battles fought over the airwaves are not limited to news reporting or political rhetoric. Entertainment informs audiences. It too shapes hearts and minds. By tapping into a fascination for the Ottoman era, Turkish dizzies have grown into an export industry, a cultural weapon for a country out to resurrect its history, if not its empire. And finally, they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, unless it's lip syncing and your name is Donald Trump. There's something about the way that President Trump delivers a soundbite, taking his words, having them coming out of someone else's mouth, that makes truth sound much stranger than fiction. Sarah Cooper, an American comedian and author, has got this formula down. So we'll leave you now with her latest TikTok treatment of Trump boasting about the amazing crowds he expected at that rally in Oklahoma, which flopped spectacularly. And watch out for the Dr. Evil reference. It's in there. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. They have a new, a pretty new, magnificent uh, arena, as you probably have heard. Uh, and we're getting exact numbers out, but we're either close to or over one million people wanting to go. Uh, we have a 22,000-seat arena, but I think we're going to also take the convention hall next door, and that's going to hold 40,000. So we'll have 22,000 plus 40,000, which would mean that we'd have over 900,000 people that won't be able to go, but uh, hopefully they'll be watching. But it's, uh, it's an amazing. Nobody's ever heard of numbers like this. And we expect to have, uh, you know, it's like a record-setting crowd. We've never had an empty seat, and we certainly won't in Oklahoma.